he's happier and thank you all right let's get started i'm going to stop sharing my screen all righty so um welcome everybody thank you for joining us tonight um welcome to backbones women and sei uh, health talks my name is emily lacy and i'm the program coordinator tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to everyone who registered via email and uploaded to our youtube channel where you can also find past recordings captioning is available by clicking on the live transcript button in the zoom screen if you are new to Backbones, our organization is committing to helping people with spinal cord injuries and similar disabilities to find connection and community. We do this by hosting events both in person and virtually, facilitating one-on-one -on -one peer support and providing resources to, ind to individuals with spinal cord injuries and their families when they're trying to navigate life post-injury. I encourage you to check out our website at www.backbonesonline.com to find more information about our programs. We are a community-led program that seeks to bring awareness and education about women's health in the context of SCI. Our topics and format were the results of two community listening sessions where women with SCI from across the country provided insights. To continue to be community-led and directed, we will send an email tomorrow with a short survey as well as a copy of this webinar, which you may share freely. The survey is three to five questions and should only take a few minutes to complete. We thank you in advance for filling this out. In addition to this recorded webinar, we also have a private, only for women with SCI, small discussion groups to unpack the conversation from tonight and share personal experiences and support. If you are interested in the small group, please go to our website at backbonesonline.com and click on the program tab. The link will also be dropped in the chat shortly. I will introduce our amazing guest speaker shortly. We will have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end of the webinar. You are welcome to submit questions for our speaker through the Q&A option or send them directly to me in chat. I will read questions that are submitted. If at any point you would like Bethany to clarify something, please use the raise your hand option and type your clarifying question in chat. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Bethany Stevens. She is a queer femme wheelchair using sex expert and disability consultant, completing a doctorate degree in sociology at Georgia State University. Barred as an attorney in the California State Bar after completing law school, as well as trained with an MA in sexuality studies from San Francisco State University. Bethany comes from a diverse background of interests that ground her sexuality work in human and civil rights. She has delivered presentations, facilitated workshops internationally, and taught courses in public health, disability studies, and social work in five states, infusing the context of pleasure politics. You can connect with her on Twitter and Instagram. We will drop her handle in the chat shortly as well. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Bethany. I will now hand the webinar over to you. Thank you, Emily and Rebecca. Um, I, I appreciate the um, invitation to come speak to y'all. Um, I'm not going to open up my slides just yet because, um, well, I may as well, actually. Um, so let me do that. Sharing with my slides. It's always a little awkward when I'm doing this. You can tell that I'm older. Um, New slide. Where is it? How do I make the slideshow? Here it is. Sorry, guys. Or thank you for your patience. So um, Emily mentioned that I am on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to reach out and have conversations that continue beyond this, or you have questions, or um, I'm going to go through some sex toys, sex tech, and if you want more information about these things, because I'm only showing you the tip of the iceberg of what is available, um, please do just feel free to reach out to me. Um, know that I 
have like a three day window. So just don't think I'm ignoring you. Um, but so I'm Bethany Stevens and I have been studying sex uh, for about 10 years. I've been within the disability rights movement working as a disability activist, educator, uh, and learning disability studies starting in the 2000s. I was a big activist on my campus, really, really into um, some social justice issues. I've worked with ADAPT and I know we have, there may be different views on ADAPT. This was years ago. Um, I did one of their marches. I've, I've just been very invested in disability. So it is always a pleasure to, for me to speak to disabled people rather than non-disabled people about disability um, because I don't have to explain what language to use because we know that people choose different language for like, it's fine. We need a plurality of language. Um, so my, my journey to sexuality came from looking at barriers. Um, that's really why I wanted to become a lawyer. Um, I wanted to tackle structural ableism because I thought that it was just, and I continue to think it's just ridiculous that some of the places where we're supposed to go meet people, partners, lovers, friends um, are inaccessible to some of our bodies. Um, the noise isn't right. Uh, the, the flashing lights can give some people seizures. I mean, just thinking about the social spaces of where we meet, there's so many structural barriers to us getting there um, into the space. And, you know, I, when we're thinking about structural ableism, I think it's really important not to just think about the par, uh, the parties and the bars and places where you might find your lovers and partners, but also thinking about how this is just a matrix of ableism that is in, intertwined in every single part of our society. Everything is not, is built not for our bodies, basically. It's built for a small, uh, a standing certain height person. Um, so structural ableism, I think, is something that we could have a, a robust conversation about. Um, people could give examples of where they've seen ableism. Um, but, you know, some other, the, the one that comes up really quite frequently with regard to reproductive justice is exam tables and uh, mammogram machines. I, I want you to know that when you age to the point of mammogram usage, you can get a scan of your breast um, with, God, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's the same thing that you would rub on the belly to see the child, the baby. I, I apologize for not knowing this, but this is something that I just learned because um, ultrasound. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, so I just learned this because I was always wondering, what are we going to do these short people? And I've always heard that this is a big issue and that there's maybe one machine in a town over and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's, it's, it's all troubling. Um, and we do have as a disabled population, um, physically disabled, we do have a much higher rate of um, breast cancer and other forms of cancer because uh, reproductive cancer, because we um, have less access to these spaces. And, you know, when we think about ableism, I think a lot of people want to just focus on structural things and how the ableism sets it up to where everything is not for us, including jobs and transit and uh, houses, for example. Visitability is a whole movement just to make houses more accessible. And um, 
as a small citation, the American Public Health Association didn't even think that visitability was a public health issue until they realized people need to pee. So maybe we should have accessible bathrooms. So <laughs> um, it is a slow journey. And I, I think those of us who are aware of social justice issues are aware that uh, change is slow to move. Um, but we can talk all about the structural ableism components, but I think the bigger part is this social part of ableism. And I, I wanna take a moment to describe what ableism is because I've spent years working on my definition and I tried to get it condensed. Um, it's a, a true prong issue. One, we are uplifting, exalting, and normalizing, naturalizing non-disability mentally and physically. And then two, we are discriminating, devaluing, uh, permitting violence against disabled people. So that's what ableism is. It's that two-prong idea parallel to racism in the sense that we're looking at privilege with like whiteness and non-disability status. And then we're looking at discrimination on the, the other, the devalued citizen. So that the social component of discrimination and um, stigma and all of those things, I think that is where the, the real pain of ableism exists with regard to dating and sexuality. Um, and, you know, I, I say this, I was born disabled and um, it's fun doing Zoom that I have to come out as disabled, um, but I, I have brittle bones and uh, I'm three foot eight. I use a wheelchair and my teenage years were awful because I didn't know that this was political. I didn't know this was a social justice issue. I thought my body was just gross and I needed to fix it. I had dreams of doing all kinds of plastic surgery to become more normal and whew, grateful none of that happened. Didn't have the budget for that. Really, really grateful. And uh, moved to college and found disability studies and activism. And I tell you, uh, the disability community saved my life. <laughs> and um, I apologize for being emotional about that, but uh, there's something so beautiful about being in disability family and just having that affirmation that these are real issues. Um, Mia Mingus calls this access intimacy where when we're in disability community, there's almost this intrinsic knowledge of each other's access needs. And so we're, we're better at just negotiating access with each other. So there's, there's all of that. But I just want you to be, sorry, thinking about how with regard to ableism, stigma, social assumptions are incredibly pervasive. I'm only gonna hit on one really big one and that is, that we are either we're desexual and we're not having real sex. Um, and I use desexual instead of asexual because we know asexuality is indeed a sexual orientation and that some people within the disability community because we are so diverse are indeed asexual. Um, so we are subject to a desexualization process where our sexuality is sort of removed from us publicly. And, um, this, this basically entails um, just disenfranchisement from sexuality. It allows for a lot of microaggressions against us and our partners thinking that they're angels or they're giving up their sex life to be with us, um, et cetera. And then the other thing about real sex is just this a uh, really interesting cultural focus on penetrative sex as the only sex that's valuable. And I think that's one of the things, like creating access requires adaptation and creativity. And I think that's what we bring 
to sex is that very thing that we are moving away from. Not that this is bad. PV sex is good. Penis vagina, go for it. Not against it. But we want to think about the universe of pleasure. So I'll give you my exercises that I think are, I, I did a workshop, a retreat around sexuality. And um, so we spent many hours doing these exercises and these could be their own individual talks with you for an hour, but just to give you an idea, one is the pleasure blueprint. This is particularly great. Um, say you are meeting or engaged sexually with a new partner or partners, or maybe your disability has shifted, or maybe you've just had an onset of your spinal cord injury. Um, so the reason why this is exciting is that it opens up the doors to where all the erogenous zones in the body are, which is super, super exciting because normative culture, again, will teach you to just focus on your genitals. So what the pleasure blueprint does is it encourages you to go over your own body or your partner or your partner's bodies with various types of touch. So soft, maybe like nails, using leather, feathers, different kinds of pressure to just go through the entire body. It's a great exercise to get to know people and really just explore bodies and slow down because we're so focused on getting to the orgasm that sometimes we don't really engage in all of this fun stuff beforehand. Anyway, so you can go through your whole body. It takes some time um, and you will find places in your body that you wouldn't think that you would have pleasure points. Um, my students have come back to me and talked about the back of their knees, um, a part of their neck, their earlobe. Um, for me, like being bitten, the top of my arm, something about it, it's great. So the pleasure blueprint is an activity for you to do and definitely feel free to do that solo because masturbation is a key to our pleasure. Um, the next one that I encourage, and these things are really forms of resistance against ableism, particularly internalized ableism, where we start believing the garbage that like I did when I was a teenager, where I was like, oh, my body is the problem. Why can't I just walk? That would make the issue better. Um, and it's, it's not that. So um, the mirror exercise can be challenging um, and it is it entails sitting in front of a mirror, clothed or not, depending on where you're at, and you just need to stare at your whole body and be able to say three things that you like about your actual physical body. And I just want to say that when I teach non-disabled folks or that's how they identify. This is still really a, a hard issue. People have body image issues um, all over the place. And there's a whole industry around uh, making us all have issues. Um, so we're gonna do the three compliments to our body. And then the one that's a little harder is to, um, to ask yourself if I really loved my body, what would I be doing for myself? And I think it's really good to just stay connected to that mirror image, stay connected to looking at your body because there is this push for us to really separate and think like, it's okay if my body is not functioning normally, I still have a brain, et cetera. We have this really intense Cartesian dualism, the split between mind body. So mindfulness actually is a way to connect to your body. Um, and so uh, if we have time at the end, I can do a tantric breathing exercise with you, but this is really just to help you step into your body. I think a lot of us, 
because of internalized ableism, because of sexual anxiety, et cetera, uh, we are disconnected. So really like taking the time to breathe and just slowing down, really lovely. If you breathe in and out, like a full breath, instead of holding your breath to push down for an orgasm, it actually will lengthen your orgasm and it will lengthen your pleasure just in general if you breathe through it. So breathing is beautiful. And then we know about creativity because we know that that's what access is made of. Um, Y'all are free and willing to tell me um, if, if you have any questions about this. Um, I, I'm open to anything around ableism. It's just, this, this is our key issue. And it's so fascinating because if you look at the majority of research around sexuality and disability, so much of it is just the sexual mechanics, just looking at, well, can the vagina still function? Can it still clasp down on a penis? Um, that's not that interesting because eventually we can figure out the mechanics to have sexual pleasure. It's this barrier of people not thinking that we're good enough, people not wanting to talk to us. It's all very strange and it's laborious and it puts our bodies through stress. And I, since I taught in public health, I know that discrimination, it's called the social determinants of health, this area, uh, discrimination has an embodied consequence on us. And so it can give us hypertension, insomnia, cause actual physical pain. But what's exciting is sexual pleasure, even masturbation can mitigate that, mitigate those issues, um, mitigate pain and even hypertension. So it's really, it's kind of exciting that the, we can combat uh, discrimination through pleasure. So I'm gonna go through some sex toys and talk to you about just the plethora of toys to be thinking about when we're just wanting to expand our sex lives with ourselves, with our partner or partners. I also wanna let you know that sex toys have gone through the roof in sales during the pandemic. And there are now sex toys, and we'll, I'll get to them, um, that you can use with an app and use it long distance. So um, partner proximity in terms of location is no longer particularly an issue, which is exciting. So um, move to our slide, our first slide, um, lubricant. So while the majority of women with spinal cord injuries, according to that mechanical sex um, studies, do maintain the ability to lubricate, self-lubricate their vaginas, I still encourage lube to everyone, um, every age. There's a lot of age stigma around this, assuming that you are an older or drier person and that somehow is against your partner and it says something bad about you. These are all just um, social perceptions that become internalized and problematic. So lube is always encouraged. It just helps everything move easier. These two um, objects here are wireless lube dispensers. You don't have to have a lot of dexterity to use them. Um, I'm showing you two because one is a fancy lube one where you have to buy their specific lube and it's $199. But then there's another one that's from uh, Amazon. It's only 25 bucks and that's to do any kind of liquid. So it actually makes more sense to do the cheaper one, which is what I always look like, I, what is always what I look at when I'm looking at sex toys for people with disabilities because I know Many of us are not, you know, economically on top of the world. 
So water-based is your foundational lubricant. It is great. It will not break a condom. Um, it's useful to clean. It's easy to clean off. Uh, it's your, your base lube. Silicone-based lube, um, and you can use it with your toys, the water-based. Silicone-based, you don't want to use with your toys, and you don't want to use with condoms. So that has to be somebody that you're fluid bonded with um, if you uh, want to have that kind of sex where there's no prophylactic in between you. Silicone is great for anal play. Um, because it is so slippery and it just it's it's tacky it stays there for a while so you have a lot of motion uh oil based not really recommended breaks condoms but a lot of people really like coconut oil and all these things but you just need to be weighing if you're doing safer sex practices and how you're doing them. So water base is always just good to have on hand. Astroglide is easy. It's at your uh, drug stores. So positioning is always a huge thing with anybody with disabilities and really anybody. Um, if people would just talk about it. Um, so, and that's just because when we are engaged in sexual activities. They are, you know, aerobic exercises. So we're gonna get tired. <laughs> also sitting in certain positions will be tiring for the body. So the example on the right, the wedge, which is $88 from Liberator. Um, this is great to like, put your body over for doggy style, lean up against or pull your pelvis up so it's easier to penetrate. Um, this is just a great positioning toy. Um, and all of the Liberator products, you can just unzip and clean everything. So you can get uh, everything all over it. Silicone lube to feces, anything, doesn't matter. Um, and they also, Liberator makes a blanket, which I recommend to disabled folks, particularly if there's any bladder and bowel um, surprises that you may have. Uh, this is a great just foundation to throw on the bed. It's your sex blanket. And then you can just pick it up, throw it in the wash. Really great. Um, so that is again by Liberator. And then this one, uh, this one on the left, it has places where you can insert dildos or vibrators so that you could actually engage in some masturbation without really using your arms to do things that you could just lean into it. Um, it's really useful. That one is a uh, hundred and fifty bucks. And then we have the ones on the budget. So you could use your ottoman in your house. Um, it just depends on who your sexual partner is and what positions you're interested in. And then these things that I found on Amazon, they're just covers for couches and they're 14 bucks. Just so you're thinking about where your bodily fluids are. But again, that blanket would solve all of those problems. Um, aside from, you know, the positioning part. Also, I don't know if we all appreciate how wonderful it is to have sex in our wheelchairs. There is utility to that. Um, I'm not saying it as a universal or as a prescription to any of you, so please understand that. Um, this is the one that people recommend and, um, it's $515 and I tried it and it basically, all it does is glide. So it's just a lot of money to penetrate someone when a Hoyer lift, for example, or some of these other things that I'll show you could be utilized so that you don't have to spend this much money. But this is a medical device. So the price is gonna go up. And that again is called intimate rider. Okay, so these are what I would actually recommend. 
um, to help with positioning. Um, and even with if you're engaged with disabled folks having sex, um, I, you know, many of my partners have been disabled. So we've had to create access together sexually. Um, this um, thing on the left is incredible. Um, it basically just goes around the back of your back and the other individual can pull on it so that they're pulling you closer and pulling you into the thrusting. Um, it, it's really useful, $22. It's by sportsheets.com. Um, a lot of these devices that they have, I see them so much as assistive devices. This is a leg spreader, which is really good if you experience spasms. So you don't have to <laughs> knock your partner in the face. Um, I've also been told that tying down legs and adding a little bit of kink play is actually really a, a fun way to um, work around the spasma or spasm issue. I do not experience them, so I, I only say that as both I've read and I've talked to many disabled people around this. So we have clitoris tech. I just wanted to show you basics of what we got here. There's a little rabbit one on the left that's just a traditional vibrator that's going to go around the bulb of your clitoris and massage that. Um, this is, um, it's 60 bucks. Uh, I encourage you, sex toys, one area, I would encourage you to look at uh, more expensive toys than you might think. The cheaper ones often have phylates in them, so you want to really look for silicone toys. But Interestingly, they are showing up even in drugstores. Okay, sorry, I touched that because I was looking at the chat. Um, okay, so the middle one is called the Satisfier. There are a whole bunch of different names because they're, they duplicate each other. Womanizer was the first. And basically what this is, is a suction that just pulls in air and you can just lay it on your clitoris, lay it on your nipples. It's just a really wonderful uh, simulation of oral sex. And then we have, of course, the like rock star sex toy, the one that's the classic uh, I plan to defend my dissertation with these things as earrings. <laughs> They're small, so not terrible. Um, this is the Hitachi Magic Wand. It's 150 bucks. It's a great body massager, uh, and it's incredible for clitoral orgasms. If it's too heavy in vibration, and this is true for all of these toys, vibrations are too heavy for you you can always put something between yourself like a towel and then use the vibration above it and then of course if you're not into vibration you can just get dildos if you're into penetration um i'm offering you three here really just to show you like this is a relatively cheap on the left relatively cheap 22 dollars, but it's silicone it's a vibrator. Um, increasingly, we're moving toward USB recharged ones, so it's healthier, it's greener. Um, and then we have this silicone in the middle that looks kind of wild. I just wanted to show you that, uh, like I said at the beginning, this is the tip of the iceberg. And so you can get any kind of interesting uh, creature to penetrate you. And there are even some where they're um, like aliens and you can create an egg out of lube and deposit it in the body. I understand that that's a particular sexual <laughs> kink. It's just interesting. Uh, it comes up and I wanted to let you know about it. That one actually is $175. 
This one on the right is a dildo proper. It's got a suction cup on it. So you can stick it on something and then ride it if you want to. Um, it's also useful to be put into a strap on if somebody's strapping onto sex to put on a dildo and then penetrate you. Um, and, you know, these can be attached to walls or different things so that you can make it accessible that you move against it. Um, but all of these are silicone. Then this is hands-free technology, really cool. The one on the left is Dame. Uh, and it's a, basically a little egg that has arms that'll wrap around the labia minora, uh, the inner lips of the vagina, and it just kind of hangs out. And the top part um, is near the clitoris and the rest is just, it's doing its work with no hands needed as, aside from placing it in place. Um, and that's $135, but this is a women owned and operated company, which is rare. So that's exciting. And then the WeVibe, the WeVibe is the uh, sex toy that really capitalized and moved first into this app work. And I did say that it's useful for long distance relationships, but it's also useful if your dexterity is limited and you just want to play with an app, it's really remarkable in that way. Um, so I've used them in both ways and um, it's pretty cool, pretty cool to have an app. Um, these are some couple technology. If you are engaging with sex with a person who has a penis um, in the sex, sexology world, we are talking about penis owners and vagina owners so that we recognize that gender and genitals do not correspond um, or they don't have to. Um, so for penis owners, these would be masturbatory tools. So we have a Wii vibe, so that's going to be app oriented. Um, and then the pulse, they're both, um, you put a shaft in there and it will do its magic. Um, they, uh, the Pulse is $149.99 and the WeVibe is $103. Um, a really popular one is Fleshlight, but it makes it a little more difficult to have partner play, whereas these things can be added into partner play. You also want to maybe consider using um, disposable vibrating cock rings, and they are called cock rings. I wouldn't use that word necessarily otherwise, and um, they're, they're stretchy and they go around the, the penis shaft. And then there's a little vibrator on top, which will then hit your clitoris um, if you are a vulva owner. Uh, it's important we, that we talk about the clitoris uh, because the majority of people with vaginas do not have orgasms through penetration alone. And then this thing on the right, this is for people who can experience vaginismus or certain pain with penetration, um, or the person is maybe too big, too girthy. And these are basically little donuts that you put and they're stretchy. So they can fit any man's penis, just like condoms. You can put a whole condom up your arm. So the size argument is always a lie. Don't ever be pushed into believing that someone is too big to put a condom on. Um, and these stretch out so that you can have more sort of protection of what's being penetrated into your body. All right, um, and we are coming to a close. So I wanna show you some strap tech that um, I particularly like the thigh strap for those of us with disabilities because um, I, I don't know if anybody is queer in this room right now or 
uh, aside from me, but I, I will say that um, as a wheelchair user, as a uh, wearing a strap on is hard. It feels like doing push ups. And so a leg strap is so much more uh, accessible. And basically, you can put it on your thigh and then somebody can simply ride you. Um, it's real. It's it's just real accessible um, and nobody's worn out. You don't, I mean, it is an aerobic exercise to engage in sexual activities, but we don't wanna be pushing our bodies past their capabilities because that is part of internalized ableism. We wanna use our bodies in ways that doesn't harm us, right? So there's that, which I'm, I'm, I'm very much behind sports sheets. And this is another one by sports sheets. None of these, people pay me. So I just, you know, and I could recommend other things for you. Uh, this is a new design for uh, strapping. It's a pair of basically boy shorts where you can put a dildo in it and it's just comfortable. Um, the one thing is it does stretch out over time, but they are in even XXXL, like 3X. So they're body inclusive there. Um, but this is, you know, and this is not just for queer people. And I apologize for starting there, actually. This is something, you know, pegging uh, or male or penetration of an individual with a penis in their anus is called pegging. And it's becoming more talked about. I don't know if it's more popular necessarily. But these strapping mechanisms offer another mechanism to engage in that. And then we have anal tech, and this is our last slide of um, the sex toys. And of course, I will give you uh, these, or I will give uh, Emily and Rebecca your had these slides, sorry, and the notes. Um, so you can look at the links at the end in the next page. But um, so we have anal technology. Anal beads we have first on the left where they are little bulbs. Um, when you are orgasming, you can, or at that point of peaking, you can, pull um, the beads out, it expands the orgasm. There um, is a book called Liberated Orgasm and it proposes that we do have different kinds of orgasms. They're qualitatively different, anally and vaginally and some purport we can have them in our mouths, fine. Um, I haven't had all of them. I don't know if you have, but it's something to try, right? Um, but I think the anus is sometimes overlooked and it is a, it's, a, it's a fun playground. This is a butt plug in the middle. This is a great reminder to you that you always, when you're engaging in anal play, to have a toy that has a flared base because things get lost in your anus. And every year, there's a list of x-rays of all the interesting things people put in their anuses. And so you don't want to be a part of that list. I mean, you could. <laughs> they do stripe, uh, take away the information, identifying information. And then, uh, sorry, the final one is just gloves, latex gloves. And I, I know that there is like an overrepresentation there, or it's very common to have latex allergies within the spinal cord injury community. Um, so there are non latex gloves, but what's great about these is just if you're penetrating, then you can just throw it away. It's good for people with OCD, um, that kind of thing. So useful stuff. Um, and I just, these, these beads remind me that, um, and I know that I'm kind of like at the end of my time, but over time by two minutes, but I just want to um, state that the, the pelvic 
floor is something that if you're not talking to your doctors about it or you're not talking to PT about it, it would be a good idea to look it up, talk to people about it. Your pelvic floor is basically um, the, the, the foundation of uh, the strength of you know, your reproductive organs and even your bladder and various things that are gonna be held into your body by the clamping of this muscle. So uh, you can actually get little balls like that to put in your vagina to stimulate it and use a TENS unit to do some Kegels so that you're keeping your, uh, your vagina tighter and uh, yeah, it working on your pelvic floor because that's a big issue with spinal cord injuries. So, I mean, it's also just a big issue with aging. Uh, this is a reason why people end up peeing on themselves when they sneeze because their pelvic floor isn't strong. So, you know, you can be doing Kegels right now just by squeezing. Um, so I will leave you there. We can open up to questions and I can also go to the one that was given to me before. I can read those oh. for you, Bethany, if you what? I can read the questions for you that were okay. submitted earlier, so you don't have to search for them in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so some of these questions um were asked during registration for this Zoom call. Um so somebody had asked, who can you talk to to get help with sexual issues? My doctors either don't feel comfortable or don't seem knowledgeable when it comes to spinal cord injury. Okay. And your doctors are usually not knowledgeable about sexuality. Uh, most med schools don't even require a class in sexuality. Uh, and if, it, if they do get one, it's going to be one class. <laughs> so... A lot of people, it's it's basically a microcosm of the larger issue in our society that we don't want to talk about sex. So what I would recommend is if your, your doctor, your gynecologist person doesn't know enough about spinal cord injury, um, you may want to do some of that research or work with your other doctor to get information and bring it to um your gynecologist. Um, but the biggest thing I think that is helping disabled people, and this is true in the literature, is that we are creating these little communities online where we are swapping information about how we can actually train these people. And, and I don't I don't mean that lightly. I feel like I have to train them to come into the room, look at me in the eyes, say hello, don't tell me what is wrong with me? Have some grace. And I may be aggressive, so you may be nicer about that, but um, that is an idea. And then of course there are sexologists within, within the realm of this community that do have spinal cord injuries. So there, there are specific resources to go to. Thank you for answering that. Uh, it kind of leads into one of the other questions. Um, somebody had asked if there's any dating websites or apps specifically for people who are disabled. Um, so there are dating apps specific to disability. Pardon me. Um, I, I have, they actually, one of them has reached out to encourage me to be something for them. Pardon me. My problem with them is that it's a segregated dating site. Um, and I think that's your individual choice, but there are, um, if you just Google disabled dating site, you can pull something up. There are at least three or four of them. The other piece aside from being segregated is that there is a over-representation of devotees, those individuals who have fetishes for us. And if that is your jam, I have no, I I, I have no shame on anybody's um, game. Uh, it's just, it depends on how you like to be worshipped. 
I don't want to just be worshipped for using a wheelchair. I mean, of course, that needs to be in the package. <laughs> but um, I know. So it's basically you use it at your own risk. And I think this would be a really good topic for discussion with y'all um, to talk about disclosure on the non-disabled or the just basic ones like tender um, and talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. Because I can tell you from my experience, not disclosing will get a lot more responses. And then you have to filter out the people who just can't handle disability. But I feel like that way you can at least push it on them and then they can have maybe a conscious issue. Hopefully they think about ableism, who knows, doubtful. But it's, it's a thing. I would encourage y'all to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. One of the other questions is um, How can a quadriplegic achieve orgasm and what sexual, I'm sorry, what sexual positions are there for quads? I wear them. So, I mean, depending on your partner, partners, or your PCA, it depends on if they can move your body in certain ways. That's something I don't know your size, for example. But as I mentioned before, Hoyer lifts can be used as sex swings. So they can be used to position you and to help you get into some activity. So a person could pull you in with the Hoyer lift or using one of those straps that I recommended. Also, I've definitely known many quads who put their wheelchairs reclined and can have quite a good time. Um, it's not always the most comfortable, but there is something I think fun about taking that thing that is not supposed to be sexual and beautiful and embraced and making it part of your hot sex life. Um, and then you asked, <laughs> you asked at the beginning about how to have like an orgasm pleasure when um, losing sensate capacity. So I offer you this as a, a passageway, an idea. Um, I have a friend who is a sexologist and you may want to check out his work actually, Rafe Biggs. Um, he is in the Bay Area, R-A-F-E, Biggs. Um, and he acquired uh, quadriplegia and uh, he was very much in a tantra and, oh, shower chairs, yes, definitely. Uh, useful for positioning. Uh, and so he was a tantra guru, which is using the breathing techniques and staring into your partner's eyes and other forms of mindfulness um, to increase pleasure. So he was really into tantra. So when he lost this physical sensate capacity, which men tend to do, however, women with spinal cord injuries tend to keep their physical sensate capacity because of the vagus nerve, which is just yay, women's supremacy. Um, <laughs> but what he did was through intentional breathing and intentional thought focusing on his thumb, through time, he got to the point where he can now have somebody suck his thumb and he can have an orgasmic experience. So it's really about relocating those erogenous zones. It's really, I think, you know, the thing, about disability and sex is that it's rewriting the rules so that they actually fit our bodies and minds. Because these, these rules, I, honestly, they're not even comfortable for non-disabled people. <laughs> people want more, we want more. So um, yeah, and I think ableism is our biggest barrier. And that is why groups like this are so important so that we can know that these are these are social issues. These are not about us. And I also, it's important to note that we do get rejected. And, and that's part of dating. That is 
definitely part of the game is rejection. And I, I, I find particularly with disabled men, they're grumpy about and like whiny to me about rejection as though it's specific to disability and it's not. You don't get to have sex with everyone you want. Um, we all experience it and you got to keep moving. I mean, that's what, that's what dating is. It's rolling the dice until you find the one. And I will tell you, I have kissed lots of frogs and beetles and other things to try to find my prince and my princess. Um, and now I'm, I'm married to my, my prince who is a woman. Um, yeah. So those are just some ideas. And um, thank you for posting Rafe Biggs. I think his organization is called Sexability, but he's based in the Bay and he would be loved. He would love to talk to you, any of you. He's, he's a really good guy. Um, thank you so much. Do we have any last minute questions? We have time for just one more. If anybody drops anything in the chat in the next couple of minutes, otherwise I have a uh, I have one more question that was asked for registration. Uh, uh, so the last question is, um, what is something that so you talked about how um, a lot of doctors are not trained in sexual pleasure. Um, so what is something that you wish or uh, you wish that doctors knew or had addressed like in any sort of rehab and that sort of setting? Like, what do you think they should know? That, so when I-, I know it's a big question. <laughs> Sorry? I know it's a really big question for a small amount of time. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I may, I don't know. We're already over time. So I, yeah. Um, uh, so what's interesting and it's not interesting. Let me just say what it is. It's sexist. It's sexist. These rehab facilities that are really intent upon helping men figure out their penises. Um, and this isn't in, in the literature. I'm not just, I don't hang out in rehab centers and ask people about their genitals. I promise. <laughs> Although we do have Shepherd Center here in Atlanta, so I could do that. Um, so in rehab facilities, there's a lot of discussion about how to get your penis working and how you can use anal penetration to create an erection and then you can actually ejaculate. Oh my God. And then there's just this gap where it's just like, well, you can still have babies. So maybe you should think about that. But there's no discussion of birth control causes um, blood clots. And so what kind of hormone levels should I be on? Because I'm, I'm living seated, uh, you know, so it should just be more balanced in terms of what we teach people. Um, and that really comes down to this idea that men are allowed to enjoy sex and women are, we're still dealing with a lot of stuff where we're still supposed to be ladies and not enjoy it. Um, so that is something I wish that was talked about, but, and, not just focus on that you can have children, but that your life, you're just, it's a new chapter. <laughs> and it's actually, in some ways you get, you gain a whole new family. And, and I know I haven't gone through a spinal cord injury, so um, I, I don't know how hard it is, but I, uh, connecting with other disabled people is just, it's really wonderful. And I think it's, <laughs> it's a gift to help you think outside the box of normativity, I think for everyone. I'm such a nerd. And <laughs> I, um, I'm not even sorry. I thank you for your patience with my, um, Although I haven't experienced a spinal cord injury, I will tell you that my disability 
has changed a lot. So I've experienced a lot of changes in my um, physical ability. So I understand that there's grieving. That's part of those bodily changes, but it's also just like, it is another chapter and you get to learn all these new pleasure points and all these new techniques. And who even knew about a lube dispenser that has no like need to like pull it out of the bottle. It's great. <laughs> so um, yeah, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I promise I will not cry all over you. <laughs> Sorry, my cat wants his dinner. All right. Um, thank you so much for that. And thank you for being vulnerable with us. Um, <laughs> we are going to wrap things up. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this is listing of our upcoming events. So thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, so our upcoming events, there has been a change of scheduling. December is now going to be the end of the year celebration. We are inviting all of you to come and go as you please. We're just going to play some games and some chatting. That's the closest we can get to a, a holiday party on Zoom. Um, and then in the new year, we will return to our regular, our regular scheduling of topics, starting with addressing and surviving abuse with Jenna Hardy Serena and preventing health care with Shonda Hilton. Um, please remember that if you are a woman with SCI, we are hosting small groups to discuss these topics in depth and to help facilitate some more community. Uh, if you are a woman with a spinal cord injury or know someone who would benefit, please visit our website, sign up for our small group discussion, or you can reach out to me. My email is listed on the screen. Uh, and a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for coming. And a big thank you for Bethany for being our guest tonight. Thank you. you. Good rest of your week.